can I help you? That remains to be seen. I'm looking for someone to share in an adventure. An adventure? Now, I don't imagine anyone west of Bree would have much interest in adventures. Nasty, disturbing, uncomfortable things. Make you late for dinner. <laughs> Adventures, nasty, disturbing, uncomfortable things. I want to thank Caroline for suggesting that I begin my message today, which is about the start of the journey with such a, a, a wonderful visual uh, piece that we, I think, all recognize. You know, don't you, that around Christmas time, uh, the Battle of the Five Armies is going to come out. It will be the last, surely, the last uh, Hobbit movie. And if it performs as the others have, uh, Peter Jackson will have made another billion dollars. That's the average take on the six Peter Jackson movies based on the Tolkien stories. Uh, J.R.R. Tolkien's uh, Lord of the Rings has sold 150 million copies. The Hobbit, I understand, has sold 100. That means a quarter of a billion books that J.R.R. Tolkien has given to the world. That puts it right up there with the Bible and the Quran and a short list of other works that everybody, if they haven't read, needs to read. So that's what I want to talk to you about this morning for just a few minutes. The theme is journey here in the gathering uh, this year that our intrepid campus ministers, Keila and Caroline and Jake and Steve, have, have given us, and it's a wonderful place to work out of, and I get the pleasure. This is both the most pleasurable and most terrifying thing I get to do every year is, is come before you in the gathering early on uh, and help develop the theme. And what a fabulous theme it is because it's a big idea. Some years ago, I was driving along the 101 in Southern California and not really paying enough attention to what I was doing, and so I veered over in front of somebody changing lanes, and, and, and when the traffic slowed down, which it always does in Southern California, this guy pulls up alongside of me, rolls down his window, shakes his hand, shakes his fist at me and says, hey, buddy, I think he said, buddy, uh, what's the big idea? And, and I, I thought to myself in that moment, what a great question. <laughs> what a great question. We spend so much of our lives fussing over and, and, and niggling around with, with little ideas and little journeys and little things. And as somebody said, the greatest tragedy is not a short life, but a small one. And so this morning, I get to, on the heels of Bilbo's invitation, talk to you a little bit about the start of the journey. Uh, most of the ideas, at least the best ones I'm going to be sharing with you over the next few minutes, come from Tim Keller. So anything you really like this morning, you can, uh, you can credit to Tim Keller and his writing. Uh, but what I really want to talk to you about is Abraham. Well, Frodo and Abraham. Because I want to take you back to the earliest journey story in the, in the Word of God, in the Bible. The first great journey story. You say, well, what about Noah? Well, that was a cruise. But, but Abraham is the first story that really takes a full-grown adult and follows him across a lifetime through several different t twists and turns in his life all the way to the end of the life. So in many ways, Abraham is, is the first great pilgrim, the first great pioneer. And here's, here's the start of his adventure. Genesis 12. The Lord had said to Abram, Leave your country, your people, and your father's household and go to the land that I will show you. I'll make you into a great nation. I'll bless you. I'll make your name great and you will be a blessing. I'll bless those who, curse, who bless you and whoever curses you I will curse and all the people on earth will be blessed through you. So Abraham left. 
It's hard to overstate the significance of this man in world history, in world religion. Do you realize that a full 55% of the people in this world take their spiritual story back to Abraham? To the Jews, he is Father Abraham, the father of the faithful. To our Muslim friends, he, friends, he is Ibrahim, a prophet. The, the, even some say the founder of the, of the Arab people. The man of truth, the friend of God, he is described in the Quran. And by the way, don't let the names uh, confuse you here. He starts out as Abram. Later, a few chapters later, God will change his name to Abraham. Abram means father. Abraham means father of many. So uh, Abraham goes from being daddy to big daddy. And so that's what I want to do this morning is is focus on, on the big daddy of monotheism. The man whose story really begins the first and and forever uninterrupted chain of the worship of the one God and who follows the call of God on a great journey which ultimately ultimately becomes a quest. And that's where all great journeys begin. They begin with a call, something in your heart, something in your soul that summons you out for reasons you may not even fully understand. The Bible says that, that Abram or Abraham was the son of a man named Terah. And in Genesis 11, it says that that Terah set out from Ur of the Chaldees to go to Canaan, but but he never got there because he stopped in the land of Haran and settled there. Now, this is interesting because what we know of the ancient uh, civilizations is that uh, is that Ur and and especially, uh, Ur in particular, was the center of moon worship. And and when Joshua calls the people of God to their destiny, a little later in the Old Testament, he he tells us something important about Tira, uh, Big Daddy's daddy. This is what Joshua says. This is in Joshua 24. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Long ago, your forefathers, including Terah, the father of Abraham and Nahor, lived beyond the rivers and worshipped other gods. But I took, says the Lord, your father Abraham from the land beyond the rivers and led him throughout Canaan, and I gave him many descendants. What that suggests is that while Abraham's daddy must have been a fine man and by all counts a successful man. He never made it to Canaan because he stopped in Haran and as far as we know was a polytheist, a worshiper of many gods including the moon. I guess he was one of the first lunatics. Sorry, some temptations are too hard to pass up. But he stays there in Haran, and it takes the invitation of God to Abram, as he was then being called, to get out. And that's literally what the call says. If you look at the call closely in Genesis 12, God says, and this is what he literally says, he says, get thee out of Haran and go to a place I will show you. He doesn't just say go. He doesn't just say leave. He says Get yourself out. Today we would say, get yourself out of here and go to the place that I will show you. So this is the first thing I want to note about the call to the journey. And that is that it will always be disruptive. It will always call you and me away from our comfort zone. It's just the nature of a call. If it's, going to, if it's going to reshape us, if it's going to be worth anything, then we can't just settle. Settle in a place that maybe our parents have made comfortable for us. It's got to disrupt us. It's got to call us out. And see, this is the story of Abraham in Scripture. He, he keeps getting called out. And there's never quite enough information, at least as far as, as you and I would would imagine we would like. There's no GPS, there's no map quest, there's no, you go here, you'll see a, you know, a, 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 you know, 
ICBY yogurt place on the corner, you turn right there, you go 0.2 miles. If you've gone to see such and such, you've gone too far. You know, it's, it's always in segments. It's always in increments. It's always God saying, all right, Abraham, it's time to, it's time to move. And Abraham moves at the call of God, even though those calls are always, always disruptive. In, in chapter 15 and again in Genesis 17, God says to Abraham, you know, I'm going to make you a great nation. And Abraham says, yeah, how are you going to do that? I don't have kids. I mean, we have a basic, you know, genealogical problem here. I don't have children. My dear wife, Sarah, is barren. How are you going to make a great nation out of a childless couple, huh? And God says, I'll do it. I can do that. Nothing's too great for God, and God will, will show Abraham how he's going to do that. Later on, and even more dramatically, God will say, um, you have this beautiful son, Isaac. His name means laughter, because everybody laughed when they heard you were pregnant, you and Sarah. But I want him. I want you to offer him to me as a sacrifice. And Abraham, you know, he, he wondered in his heart, deep in his heart, why? why? Why would you do that, Lord? Why would you take my son from me? Why would you ask such a horrendous thing? But, but Abraham went up the mountain with Isaac, and, and, and God worked that out in a most redemptive way. But this, this was the story. This was the disruption that a really good journey always brings. But the second thing I want to say about a really good journey is the best of all journeys is a quest. And that's what Abraham was being called on to, called to. Not just a journey, but a quest. One of the other many lovely things I get to do around here, favorite things, is I teach a little class uh, on the faith and the writing of J.R.R. Tolkien for our lifelong learning program. And it's been interesting to me as I've del uh, delved deeper into Tolkien's life that, uh, to, to discover there's a big difference between The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings. And, and one literary critic put it this way. He said, The Hobbit is an adventure, much as we saw Bilbo being called to. The Lord of the Rings is a quest. And that's true, very true. The Hobbit is an adventure. It's a, it's a fun thing. It's a, you know, Bilbo has said, uh, go out with these, these wacky dwarves and help them get their gold back from the evil dragon Smaug. And he does, and he comes back home. And that's why the, the first story is called There and Back Again. He goes on his adventure, and he comes back. He has a good time. And he brings some gold with him. That's an adventure. Tolkien wrote that for his kids. He never intended that to be pu published. Uh, he, one day he was writing in his study and he wrote down for reasons he couldn't understand. In a hole in the ground there lived a hobbit. And he thought, huh, I wonder what in the world I mean by that. I'll have to invent a story to go with that. And he did. He had four children and much to their delight over the next year or so, he wrote The Hobbit. It was an adventure story. When I uh, graduated from Lipscomb not too long after that, a good friend of mine, Ken Slater, another uh, Lipscomb graduate and I went on a road trip. I, I hope you all get some road trips in your life. We got in Ken's 66 Mustang and we headed west and mooched all the way across America at every home of every relative of a Lipscomb student that we could possibly discover. And uh, we slept out under the stars every night. Well, not quite. We had a six foot tent, uh, which meant five inches of me slept outside under the stars every night. But we had a fabulous time. I'll never forget our road trip. It was a great adventure. The Hobbit is an adventure. I wish you many adventures. But what I really wish you, and here's the big idea that I want to plant in your head this morning, is a quest. It took J.R.R. Tolkien 12 years to write The Lord of the Rings. He spent another several years massaging it, tinkering with it, getting it just like he wanted. He was never really satisfied with it. But if you have read those books, you know The Lord of the Rings is a much different kind of work. It is a grown-up story. It's full of suffering. It's full of moral dilemmas and complexities. And when Frodo sets out, pretty early on, he gets, he gets it that he's probably not coming back. Because an adventure, a journey that we enjoy is about there and back again. 
And we get some things when we're out there. We get some souvenirs. We get some experiences. We have fun. But Frodo went on a quest, which meant he went out to give something up, and that probably included Frodo himself. Remember, as he stands at the crack of doom, well, he couldn't quite do it. Sam helped him to get there, and then Gollum comes along and, and makes sure it happens. And, but but this, is a, this is giving your all. That's the difference in a quest and, a, and, a, and a, an adventure. Is you're prepared to give it all up because you believe what you're doing will bless the world. Or that God somehow can use your best efforts, your sincerest intentions to be a blessing. And that's the third thing I want to say about the journey that you're called to is that if God is in control of it, you will be a blessing to his world. Isn't that what God says to, to Abraham at the very beginning? He says, go, I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you and I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. Now, you know you're blessed, right? I mean, you've, I, I, I'm guessing you figured that out. A long time ago. What does President Lowry say when he, when he gathers us for the initium every year? He says to you, freshman, do you realize what a small percentage of the people on this planet get to go to college and get a college degree? Do you realize what a minority you are, what an incredibly privileged, what a, what a very blessed and incredibly fortunate group of people you are? Let us never lose sight of the fact that we are blessed beyond all deserving and all measure. But the question, my question is, why are you being blessed this way? You ever wonder that? Why me? Why, why do I get to be blessed like this? And I think the best answer is so that you may be a blessing. You see, there's two ways to handle this, this privileged life that, that, that we enjoy. One, one is to just keep grabbing for all the gusto, going out on the adventure and, and getting all the great experiences and maybe getting some gold along the way and, and just, just mining God's world and his environment for all that we can get out of it and, 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 and getting the world to bless us. Bless me more, bless me more. I love to be blessed. Bless me, bless me. And we, and we become victims of our own appetite for blessing. And you know what happens when we do that is we just... Uh, we just never get filled up. We just kind of stay empty and unsatisfied. That story has been written again and again. But when we allow God to make of us a blessing, to channel his blessings through us in the vocation, the calling that we hear the call to and heed in his name, in the need, in the in the name of greater kingdom-like purposes, then, then we are filled in that to overflowing. David Foster Wallace, wonderful postmodern writer who died too young, talks about the value of a real education. And he says, the value of a real education is the blessing of choosing what you will worship. Listen to what he says. This, I submit, is the freedom of a real education. You get to consciously decide what has meaning and what doesn't. You get to decide what to worship. And there's no such thing as not worshiping. Everybody worships. The only choice we get is what to worship. Now, if you worship money and things, he says, you'll never have enough, never feel you have enough. If you worship your body and beauty and sexual allure, you'll always feel ugly. And when time and age start showing up, You'll die a million deaths before they finally plant you. Worship power, and you'll end up feeling weak and afraid, and you'll need even more power and over others to numb you to your own fears. Worship your intellect, being seen as smart, and you'll end up feeling stupid, a fraud, always on the verge of being found out. But the really important kind of freedom involves attention and awareness and discipline and being able truly to care about other people and to sacrifice for them over and over in myriad, petty, unsexy ways every day. And that, he says, is real freedom. So I give you Big Daddy. 
Abraham, Father Abraham, Ibrahim, the father of the faithful, the man who in Hebrews 11, as we read earlier, went out not knowing where he was going, but heeding again and again and again the call of God, not to just a journey, not to just an adventure, but to a quest. And when you think about it, that's precisely what Jesus did. He left his father's house, left the absolute best security of all, heaven itself, that he would walk among us, be part of our community, be tempted with us, show us how to serve, show us how to love, that he would give himself up fully and absolutely that the world might be blessed through him. It's always going to be a journey. You're never going to see the whole trip unfold before you, but God will make you able for the next phase if you are faithful and hear the call. It's like the great writer E.L. Doctorow said about writing. I say about the journey of faith. It's like driving at night in the fog. You can only see as far as your headlights, but you can make it the whole trip that way. Or as uh, a song I just learned two Sundays ago says, this is the song Come Away, performed by uh, Jesus Culture. It says, come away with me, come away with me. Who's talking? God's talking. I have a plan for you. It's going to be wild. It's going to be great. And it's going to be full of me. It's going to be wild, disturbing, uncomfortable, sure. But you need that. It's going to be great. You get to be a blessing to the world. And what makes it all worthwhile and empowers us to make it happen at all is it's going to be full of the one who is our daddy, our creator, the one who wants nothing more than for the love that he pours into you to be spread abroad, abroad in the broken world. May God bless you on your journey. May it be for you a true quest.